Um, well, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to uh, this GE Gastro Echo uh, presentation hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with uh, Project Echo uh, from the University of Mexico, New Mexico. Uh, these tutorials or meetings are run uh, every second Monday at uh, six o'clock. Uh, we try to make them widely available to um, all of our community within the sub-Saharan and even further uh, Africa region. Um, this evening's talk is on uh, cholangitis and cholecystitis uh, by Dr. Machichwa, uh, who is based in Johannesburg. Um, Dr. Machichwa will begin shortly. He's put together an excellent presentation um, that I'm looking forward to, to sharing with, with you and the rest of the audience this evening. Um, I would just ask that uh, attendants or delegates could please just ensure that um, the uh, microphones and cameras are off in order just to save on bandwidth. Um, if you have questions during the course of the meeting, I'd encourage you to um, put them into the chat room, please, um, and we'll come to them uh, in due course at the, at the end of the meeting. So I think without any further ado, started. Um, again, if I could just ask delegates, please, to switch off their microphones and their cameras um, as they join the meeting, just to save on bandwidth um, and improve the, the quality of presentation. Good. Uh, Dr. Machichwa, thank you for uh, offering to uh, take us through this topic, and uh, I'll let you take it from there. Right. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, my name is Dr. Mchichwa. I'll be uh, taking you through the uh, presentation as introduced by uh, Dr. Baymaster. Um, let me just share my screen. Share and then present the mode. All right, good. All right, um, everyone can see my slides. We can, Peter Zai. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to start with the first slide, which shows the outline of the talk. I'll be introducing cholangitis, uh, going through the diagnosis, uh, investigations, um, subsequent management, and also talk uh, on cholecystitis. Uh, we'll look at the epidemiology, also including some local data there, uh, the diagnosis, uh, diagnostic criteria, and the approach to uh, management. Um, so the risk factors for um, acute uh, cholangitis, this comes with uh, I mean, basically, stasis and infection of uh, the biliary tract. Um, so the subsequent presentation of a fever, the jaundice, uh, and abdominal pain. Um, biliary calculi uh, is uh, the main culprit there uh, in patients that are presenting with uh, an acute uh, cholangitis. Um, subsequent to that will be your uh, benign biliary structures as may be found in post-infectious uh, like HIV cholangiopathy um, or inflammatory like uh, PSC. And also malignancy can be a uh, risk factor for this uh, cholangitis and this malignancy could be from the presence of the tumor uh, in the gallbladder or bile duct, ampulla or duodenum and pancreas. Uh, other risk factors for an acute uh, cholangitis include uh, uh, post-ERCP uh, and uh, the structured biliary uh, enteric anastomosis as we can uh, care post uh, upus procedure, post liver transplant or resection, ruined Y hepatico uh, Also patients with the syndrome, uh, SAM syndrome, which is with the uh, distal common bile duct obstruction uh, by food or stones or debris, 
um, in patients with uh, biliary enteric uh, anastomosis. You can also have uh, extrinsic compression of uh, the bile duct due to a um, duodenary periambular diverticular, which is called uh, Lemel syndrome. Or you can have uh, also Mirisi syndrome, which would be obstruction of the cystic duct or the neck of the um, gallbladder by a stone. I mean, uh, the stone will be impacted in the uh, neck of the gallbladder or the cystic duct, obstructing the either the common hepatic or will be obstructing the um, the CVD. Uh, you can also have uh, either obstruction by blood clot or parasitic uh, infections. Uh, the pathogenesis of an acute cholangitis uh, includes uh, uh, you know, a disruption to normal uh, a physiology. Normally, we have uh, the sphincter of Audi, um, which provides the mechanical barrier to uh, duodenal reflux and ascending uh, bacterial infections. And also the flow of the bowel um, acts as a bacteriostatic. Um, uh, it does act as a bacteriostatic. And also we have the biliary mucosa uh, secreting the IgA, uh, which acts uh, against the defense, uh, which is a defense mechanism for the infections of the biliary tree. So when you have destruction of this uh, um, barrier mucosa, can also have uh, increased intra-biliary pressure due to obstruction. Um, so if you have uh, the damage, you have increased permeability uh, of the bile ductules, uh, which will then permit translocation of bacteria and toxins from the uh, portal circulation into the biliary tree. And then uh, vice versa, you can have migration of bacteria from the uh, biliary tree into the circulation uh, with subsequent um, uh, with the subsequent uh, septicemia. Um, so the microbiology that we can uh, attribute uh, to uh, cholangitis, um, the Tokyo guidelines uh, points out that E. coli and Klebsiella, they are the main uh, pathogens from the gram-negative uh, side. And then from the gram-positive side, we have the enterococcus species and the streptococcus um, as the main pathogens uh, affecting, uh, that can be cultured from the uh, bio. And then locally in KZN, studied by KS Chiliza, uh, also demonstrated the similar. From the gram-negative side, we have the E. coli and the Klebsiella, uh, being the main pathogens. Uh, also, from the gram-positive side, the enterococcus species were the main uh, pathogens isolated. And also of note was that uh, there was really no statistical significance uh, in terms of uh, bacterial bilia between the HIV-positive and the HIV-negative uh, population. Uh, this was a study by uh, Chiliza uh, down in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. Um, what are the clinical manifestations? Um, so when we were medical students, we were taught initially of the charcoal triad, um, which then is then present in about 24 to 72% of patients. Um, so this charcoal triad includes the fever, jaundice, and abdominal pain. However, there are issues with this. It's quite low uh, sensitivity, but uh, the specificity is quite high. So not all the patients will, have, will exhibit uh, this triad. Um, when the infection is severe, you have what's called a Raynaud's pentad, that would be a charcoal triad, uh, plus the hypotension and altered uh, mental state. Uh, so also patients can present with complications of um, uh, an acute cholangitis. Uh, they'll present with um, hepatic abscesses, they will have right upper quadrant pain, they will actually present in sepsis, septic, uh, septic shock or they'll present with, uh, uh, in the extremities with uh, multi-organ dysfunction. Um, so the Tokyo guidelines um, updated in 2018 um, outlined the diagnostic criteria um, that uh, was shown to be much better in terms of uh, sensitivity 91.8 and the specificity of 77%. And also the false positive uh, rate for diagnosing acute cholangitis was significantly lower um, with this uh, Tokyo guidelines. 
at a 5.9 percent as compared with the charcoal stride only which showed uh, um uh, uh, false positive rate of about 11.9 percent um so in terms of uh what's included in the diagnostic criteria we have uh, systemic inflammation we have cholestasis and then we have imaging under systemic inflammation we are looking at the fever um 38 degrees or we are looking at oh, a patient that presents with chills. And also under systemic inflammation, we are looking at laboratory data as uh, evidence of uh, inflammatory response and CRP and white cell count. And then under cholestasis, uh, patient with jaundice or laboratory um, evidence of um, abnormal liver function test. And under imaging, they demonstrate either biliary dilatation or evidence of um, etiology on uh, imaging in terms of could there be a stricture, could there be a stone, or is there predisposing uh, other event with like a stent? Um, so patients are then subclassified into a suspected diagnosis or definitive diagnosis. For patients with uh, suspected diagnosis, you have uh, at least one in A and one item in B or C. Whereas for definitive diagnosis, you need at least uh, one item in each uh, subgroup. Um, and then in terms of uh, imaging, um, ultrasound is the uh, first line uh, modality. And then um, it can identify uh, the cause of an acute uh, cholangitis and can actually detect um, cholelithiasis uh, in 30% uh, uh, of cases. Uh, CT abdomen uh, that are not affected by gas, and uh, it's able to detect uh, cholelithiasis in about 42% of cases. It's got also an advantage that clearly uh, identifies the bile duct dilatation and uh, the presence of uh, biliary stenosis. It also aids in the um, exclusion of uh, other differential diagnosis. Uh, in this case, could be uh, pancreatitis, uh, et cetera. Um, MRI, MRCP is reserved for patients uh, with um, a diagnostic dilemma and it's uh, got an 82% accuracy uh, in terms of detecting cholelithiasis. Another modality uh, which is uh, included in terms of diagnosis but not routinely done uh, will be an endoscopic ultrasound scan, which shows, which will then provide about 96.9% accuracy in detecting um, cholelithiasis, actually better than the uh, MRI, MRCP. Um, differential diagnosis, I've alluded to uh, one of it, acute pancreatitis will also be an acute uh, cholecystitis, which can go, may also go together with an acute cholangitis, could be a biliary leak, uh, could be liver abscess, uh, or an acute hepatitis, pyelonephritis, and um, uh, acute right-sided uh, diverticulitis. Um, then in patients that are presenting with, in shock, you have to uh, consider other uh, diagnoses that can actually present to, uh, in, uh, in shock. Uh, also in young females, sexually active, uh, they may have peri uh, they may be having a PID and an associated uh, perinephric correction with QTC syndrome. Um, and then in terms of severity, you need to uh, grade um, uh, the severity of the patients as also this has got a good uh, prognostic uh, value. And then you grade them as grade mild, which is grade one or moderate uh, grade two or grade three. Patients with grade three, um, um, in terms of severity, uh, they will have an accompanying um, organ failure uh, in terms of cardiovascular could be hypotension requiring uh, dobutamine, five mics per kilo, or any dose of uh, uh, no epinephrine or adrenaline. They will have a neurological dysfunction, which may present with uh, confusion. They will have a respiratory dysfunction exhibited by a PF ratio of uh, three, less than 300, or renal dysfunction. They will also have a um, hepatic dysfunction, uh, failure, I mean, an raised INR 1.5. Uh, hematological dysfunction and thrombocytopenia less than 100. Uh, whereas in patients with grade 2, um, they wouldn't be exhibiting organ failure per se, but they will have a characteristic findings in terms of uh, laboratory um, workup, uh, white cell count, 
greater than 12 or less than 3, um, fever above 39, uh, old patients, hyperbilirubinemia, or hypoalbuminemia. So for patients to qualify in this grade, you need at least two of these. Uh, patient with mild, these are just patients with none uh, of the above uh, criteria. How do we approach them in terms of uh, managing? Um, so patients in grade one, um, generally we antibiotics and general supportive care, they may finish course and resolve, but um, ultimately they may need biliary drainage if uh, the cause is identified. For patient with uh, grade two, um, antibiotics, general supportive care, early drainage is recommended. And grade three is actually agent uh, biliary drainage. And then, uh, um, so the treatment there for biliary drainage is for uh, the etiology. Uh, in terms of uh, antibiotics, uh, there are quite a number of antibiotics um, regimens that are recommended either as a single agent or um, a combination um, regimen. But uh, commonly in our settings, uh, most of our patients will be uh, on PPSR uh, tazobactam, uh, which will be given at a dose of 4.5 grams IV uh, six hourly. But again, I have to mention that uh, from the study that uh, was done in KwaZulu Natal uh, by Chilis that I quoted to earlier, um, bacteriopilia there was actually also susceptible to uh, augmenting and um, was also susceptible to uh, ciprofloxacillin. So in patients with uh, penicillin allergy, you can uh, consider the uh, quinolone. Um, looking at um, some of the data uh, that is available for early endoscopic and late um, uh, endoscopic uh, ERCP in patients with acute uh, cholangitis. Uh, so this um, study, uh, showed that, I mean, was was it included all patients um, that had uh, ERCP uh, either early or late. And then um, it also included patients that had mild to moderate cholangitis and then also patients with uh, severe cholangitis. And then they looked at uh, the in-hospital mortality um, and the 30-day mortality and they also looked at 30-day uh, readmission uh, rates for all the groups. And then um, early um, ERCP was uh, regarded as less than 42 compared to late ERCP, I mean, 48 hours compared to late um, ERCP, uh, or which was regarded as more than 48 hours. And what did they found? They found that um, for in-hospital mortality for all the patients, um, there was a, a, as I said, 2.4 percent uh, mortality compared to 1.2 uh, percent mortality for early ERCP, and then 30-day mortality 1.5 percent for early compared to 3.5. Um, for 30-day mortality, <laughs> excuse me, um, early ERCP 9.7 compared to uh, 15.7, and the result was uh, statistically significant for all. And also, if we can note that for patients with severe uh, cholangitis, the mortality was quite high uh, compared to uh, the patients with mild to moderate cholangitis. Um, we're looking at 10.2 versus 3.2 percent for early, uh, 13 percent to 3.4 uh, for 30-day mortality, and also can look at the statistical significance there. Um, so if we look at decompression, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, um, so patients, there may be patients that may just uh, be qualifying for decompression alone versus more uh, endoscopic therapy. So when do we really uh, consider decompression alone? This is when patients are uh, hemodynamically unstable or patients that are quadripathic or have been receiving uh, antithrombotic agents. Um, also, we look at uh, ERCP versus uh, insertion of uh, PTBD uh, for uh, decompression. Um, so ERCP is associated with, uh, uh, with reduced length of stay, um, reduced adverse events, uh, better patient values as compared to uh, PTBD. Uh, so PTBD is uh, reserved for patients with difficult anatomy or a failed ERCP or sick patients. 
and other note that uh, PTBD is associated with an uh, increased risk of uh, biliary uh, peritonitis um, associated with uh, intraperitoneal hemorrhage, uh, bacteremia, uh, abscess formation, whereas um, ERCP main adverse events there will be um, pancreatitis. Um, we can also consider uh, EUS guided biliary drainage, but uh, at what point? This is when uh, ERCP um, is unsuccessful. We don't have uh, access to PTBD, and also that will be patients with um, gastric obstruction or patients with uh, surgically altered anatomy who consider uh, doing an EUS guided biliary drainage. Uh, so I'll move on to uh, cholecystitis. I'm not sure if uh, we should be pausing for questions there, but I think let me move on. Um, so cholecystitis, on the other hand, um, patients will present with uh, right upper quadrant pain, fever, uh, leukocytosis. Um, this is associated with uh, gallbladder inflammation. Um, it's, it can be a calculus, cholecystitis, which is seen in 5 to 10 percent of cases, but we'll concentrate more on the patient with acute um, calculus cholecystitis, which will be due to cystic duct obstruction as well. Um, pathogenesis there uh, can vary from mild edema to uh, you know, acute uh, inflammation to necrosis and also to the gangrene of uh, the gallbladder. It can actually also progress to um, worse complications in terms of uh, cholecysto uh, enteric anastomosis, septicemia, also when they come in. Um, also, it's not only uh, biliary obstruction has been uh, attributed to the ensuing of cholecystitis, but uh, the production of uh, lysolethin by uh, lecithin uh, from the lining of, from the um, cells lining the gallbladder. Um, it's been associated uh, with uh, uh, cholecystitis. Um, looking at a bit of the epidemiology, this was a study done by uh, Dr. Khan at, uh, in, at the WITS, uh, University of the West Water Sun. Um, it basically looked at um, the rate of the changes in cholecystitis rates that were associated with, um, uh, with, uh, with gallstones from 2009 to 2018 versus 2004 to uh, 2008. So what they uh, they found out there was that there was, I mean, this included uh, almost all the province except one, which was KZN, which was excluded in this study because they didn't have uh, the data for 2009 to 2018. And then they noted a spike in um, laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy rates uh, in all the province except the uh, Northern Cape, which there was a decline um, in cholecystectomy rates. Um, so they initially attributed to you know, uh, the advent of uh, and the enthusiasm of surgeons performing uh, cholecystectomies in these patients. But then what they also figured out that was that um, with the subsequent years, there were younger patients that were coming in, uh, especially females, um, and then they compared this to the change in urbanization um, that occurred uh, between the same period. Um, then they figured out that in Northern Cape, there was actually also a decline in the urbanization compared to all the other provinces that were, 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 were taken to. So, uh, and this also then concluded that urbanization um, has got uh, an impact in the Boston prevalence. Um, as uh, there is an association between gallbladder and uh, Western diet. This was also uh, in, in a similar study in Japan also um, had the same uh, similar findings. Um, also of note in that uh, in this study by Dr. Khan, um, the male to female ratio was one to six um, as compared to the global one, which is uh, one to three. Um, and these were uh, young females subsequently. Um, so the diagnostic criteria um, for, for acute uh, cholecystitis, also from the Tokyo Guidelines 2018, um, requires that we have local signs of inflammation, systemic signs of inflammation, 
and imaging uh, with findings which are characteristic of acute uh, cholecystitis. Excuse me. Um, so for local inflammation, we have uh, clinically the Murphy sign, um, and then right upper quadrant mass, pain or tenderness. Uh, for systemic inflammation, we have fever, elevated um, therapy, and um, elevated white cell count. Imaging findings uh, are, uh, on my next few slides will show some characteristic imaging findings uh, that we can find in patients with acute uh, cholecystitis. So for again, we divide them into suspected diagnosis or definitive diagnosis. Suspected diagnosis will have one item in A, one item in B, and um, uh, for definitive diagnosis, we'll have um, one item in A and B and C. And the diagnostic accuracy ranges from uh, 60 to 94% of this uh, diagnostic criteria. Um, this criteria was uh, critiqued by uh, the World Society of uh, Emergency Surgery in 2016, and then they put down this uh, sensitivity to about uh, 53.4% in the diagnosis of uh, acute cholecystitis. Um, so again, uh, we will have to grade our patients uh, in terms of severity. Um, so most of the um, criteria is similar to the ones that we uh, discussed for an acute uh, cholangitis. We grade them into mild, uh, mild or grade one, grade two, and grade three. And then um, this slide will show I mean, the significance um, of uh, grading these patients. Uh, we see that 30-day mortality for patients that are in grade three, they've got a 37, um, I mean, 5.4% 5 5 uh, 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 more than 30-day mortality was 5.4 compared to grade one, which showed 5.1 I mean, and 0.8. Uh, percent and the result there is statistically significant. This is cited from uh, Yakoe et al. So it is important to uh, grade our our patients. Uh, it does uh, have a, a value in the mortality. Um, so in terms of imaging, again, ultrasound scan is the uh, first choice imaging modality. Um, then other modalities include the HIDA scan, um, which is actually better in terms of um, sensitivity compared to ultrasound and MRI. Um, HIDA scan is not widely available, but once, uh, when it's available, we normally use it for, we would use it for when uh, the diagnosis is uh, uh, uncertain. But uh, if we can have a closer look at, uh, we can compare the ultrasound sensitivity and specificity um, as compared to the MRI. Um, it does perform very well, uh, com compared to the MRI, like 82.82% uh, uh, and 0.83 um, with a 95% confidence interval as noted. Um, so, so this forest plot is adapted from the Tokyo guidelines. So the advantages of uh, your of our uh, ultrasound scan is, but it's quite uh, it's got low invasiveness, it's widely available. Um, it's easy to use and it's cost effective compared to the MRI and the HIDA scan. Um, although the limitations of ultrasound scan is the uh, variability with the use, its user dependence. Um, one of the some of the characteristics for the ultrasound that we see on the imaging, so we can see debris, we can see gold stones on ultrasound with its uh, characteristic acoustic shadow. We can see peri um, cholecystic fluid collection. And when there is complications uh, in terms of uh, infosomatous uh, cholecystitis, you can have uh, an uh, intraluminal um, uh, flap. Um, when you look at the uh, MRI uh, compared to uh, the CT scan, I mean, MRI will have better imaging if you can look at this um, imaging. Uh, the gallbladder wall there enhances quite nicely uh, on, on this uh, MRI compared to when you do your your CT scan, and also gallstones here actually looking much uh, much more clearer compared to when you look them at the CT scan. Um, so when do we use the MRCP MRI if the ultrasound scan is not providing a definitive diagnosis? Um, 
And uh, the diagnostic criteria there, when we have then a gallbladder wall greater than four millimeters, you can have enlargement of the gallbladder. Uh, long axis will be from here to here, uh, more than eight centimeters, or short axis be um, more than four centimeters, suggestive uh, of um, gallstones. And then if there is thickening, it's suggestive of a cholecystitis. Um, you can see gallstones as well with an MRI, and you can see a uh, debris. Uh, fluid accumulation around the bladder, you can also see, and then that's highly suggestive of an acute uh, cholecystitis. Um, so on the management or in the approach to patients with uh, uh, cholecystitis, you also have to consider the association um, with the common bile duct stones. Um, so common bile duct stones, um, which is called docolithiasis, occurs in about 10 to 20 percent of patients with gold stones, and then about five to 15 percent in cases of an acute acalculus uh, cholecystitis. Um, in that point, we also have to guard against the use of a liver function test or bilirubin as the only method to uh, suspect that there is a uh, common bile duct stones in patients uh, with um, acute uh, cholecystitis, because these uh, elevated liver enzymes can be uh, can happen due to uh, associated uh, inflammation and subsequent swelling of the either hepatic duct, uh, common hepatic ducts, or uh, common bile ducts. Um, so you have to risk ratify your patients um, to see uh, the probability of having uh, a common bile duct stones. So you risk stratify them as having either high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk. Patients with high risk, these are the patients that will show a CBD stone uh, on ultrasound scan or a cross-sectional image, or patients with acute cholangitis. So they have a 50% um, chance of actually having a, a, a CBD stone. Patients with intermediate risk who have abnormal liver function tests, like uh, also age above 55 and dilated uh, common uh, bile duct on ultrasound scan on common on cross-sectional imaging. Um, dilated CBD, that would be six millimeters on a patient with uh, gallbladder and more than eight millimeters in a patient who has had a cholecystectomy. And low-risk patients, these are patients that are no obvious uh, predictors. Um, so in terms of uh, treatment of patients with uh, common bile duct stones and patients with uh, acute uh, calculus cholecystitis, so you can actually offer them preoperative ERCP with sphincterotomy or intraoperative uh, ERCP with sphincterotomy or laparoscopic or open uh, bile duct exploration or postoperative ERCP with uh, um, um, sphincterotomy. There's really no uh, significant difference in terms of morbidity, mortality, and success rates uh, to these uh, approaches. Um, so what's the timing of our cholecystectomy in patients with uh, acute uh, calculus cholecystectomy, um, cholecystitis? Um, so it's divided into early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is within uh, seven days from uh, admission and within 10 days of symptoms. Then intermediate uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy would be between seven days and uh, six weeks. Uh, then delayed uh, laparoscop laparoscopic cholecystectomy would be between six weeks and um, uh, three months. Uh, so the best approach there is an early um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Then if that's not possible, you go for a delayed. Uh, as compared to our uh, intermediate. Um, I looked at a couple of, uh, uh, some studies. This was a randomized control study uh, by Carstens that looked into early versus uh, delayed um, cholecystectomy. Um, so the morbidity um, was uh, high in patients with, uh, was higher in patients with, um, delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy compared to patients with uh, immediate, which is less than 24 hours. Uh, also, uh, the adverse events were higher in patients with delayed, um, delayed laparoscopic cholecystectomy versus the immediate. 
subsequently, the total hospital stay was also statistically significant uh, for patients with delayed compared to uh, early or immediate. Uh, also, the cost, um, the hospital cost was uh, significantly less in patients with uh, early compared to delayed. Uh, this is another randomized control study that also looked at the uh, early versus uh, delay for an acute cholecystitis. Um, what they also found out was that the overall morbidity was um, statistically significantly higher in delayed compared to early. Um, also, the total hospital stay um, and the hospital cost was uh, statistically significant was less in patients with early. So the recommendation is early laparoscopic cholecystectomy where resources are permitted compared to delay. Um, so intermediate, which is seven to three months, uh, it's actually uh, not recommended. We'd rather go for the delay compared to uh, intermediate, but the best is early. Uh, so how do we approach uh, patients with uh, acute cholecystectomy? Uh, calculus cholecystitis. Um, so the first block is to risk um, predict the patients and is the patient suitable for surgery or is the patient accepting surgery? So if the patient is not uh, a surgical candidate or is refusing surgery, you admit the patient, um, observe, observe the patient and give antibiotics, assess it for eight hours. Uh, if there is a success, um, then you can either continue the antibiotics or discharge the patient. But if there is no success, then this patient will require um, whole bladder drainage, um, either by um, percutaneous transhepatic um, whole bladder drainage or by um, endoscopic whole bladder drainage. And if there is success, uh, then we can uh, consider surgery later or discharge. In patients, most of the patients, uh, they will fall uh, into this uh, trajectory where they are surgical candidates. And then at that point, they have to risk stratify. Do they have an associated common bile duct stones uh, or not? Uh, if they have an associated common bile duct stones, then you assess, are they, would they um, um, risk for, I mean, are they going straight for surgery or you want to do either an uh, EUS or MRCT before they go to surgery. But the target there, if they can be uh, done within 72 hours uh, in terms of uh, early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, or they can be done within seven days as uh, defined by our early laparoscopic cholecystectomy, um, then this patient was on that route. If otherwise they miss this board, the seven days um, of presentation or 10 days of um, presenting to hospital with symptoms, um, then you can decide the patient and then offer them uh, a delayed laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy. This is how we uh, approach our, our patient with an acute uh, um, calculus cholecystitis. Um, my last slide will be just a recap on our patients with, the, I mean, a couple of more slides actually. Um, so the antimicrobial treatment regimens for patients that is um, are presenting with uh, cholecystitis, uh, they are similar to patients with uh, cholangitis, but um, I looked at uh, uh, how they penetrate uh, the gallbladder or the biliary system. So the serum penetrance there is greater than five. Uh, again, our PPSR and uh, tazobactam um, is uh, on top uh, among other uh, antibiotics in this group. And then antibiotics with low penetrance will be uh, cefotaxim, uh, meropenem, kefotazidim, and uh, imipenem. Um, but then the general principle there is to give patients with uh, antibiotics with a good uh, gram-negative anaerobe and also um, a gram-positive cover. Uh, take home message for patients with um, Acute uh, cholangitis will be early biliary drainage and antibiotics. Um, because if we look at the data there, it says in during the pre endoscopic era, uh, the mortality for patients that were presenting with um, acute uh, cholangitis was more than uh, 50%. Now the mortality is actually less uh, than 10% after uh, biliary drainage. So the key message there is uh, patient with cholangitis. 
um, early period drainage and antibiotics. Um, thank you very much. This was my um, uh, references. Uh, we'll take questions and uh, comments. All right. So I thank you very much. I think that was a really excellent overview. Um, I think you really covered um, most of the, 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 the key points. Um, I'm just going to, there aren't any questions in the chat room just yet. So um, I'll encourage people, if you have queries, if you have questions, just pop them in the chat room. Um, perhaps what we'll do while we wait for that to happen, maybe I'll just make a couple of, of general comments just about one or two issues um, as, as you've gone through it. But again, once again, I think it was a, a really great talk and I think you covered um, all of the important areas well. Um, so if I may just, so, so I think it is important to appreciate, you know, that virtually all biliary obstruction, um, well, all biliary obstruction, we can divide into benign and malignant causes. And obviously the vast majority of benign causes of acute biliary obstruction that one will see will be gallstone related. So it's often useful to think of, um, certainly when you see these patients initially, is, you know, are you dealing with stones, a malignancy, or, or maybe something unusual uh, and other? And I think that's useful because um, certainly if we compare stone disease um, and malignancy, it's a lot more unusual for patients with malignant disease to present with sepsis de novo. So when patients present with cholangitis specifically, quite often, almost, well, certainly far more often, that's going to be related to stone disease. And I think that has relevance for the degree to which we should be aggressive in our intervention. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is that, you know, the, the patients who present the sickest are also the patients who generally have benign disease, and therefore they warrant uh, uh, aggressive intervention and treatment. And this is a disease that can become uh, severe very quickly. And even today, um, despite all the modern therapies that we have, and, and the better health systems that we have in some places, um, patients still die of cholangitis. And we, we really need to ask ourselves, um, you know, is, is that appropriate in, in this day and age when we have the therapies available to us that, that we do? So, so when you see patients with cholangitis, please be, be, uh, have a low threshold to make the diagnosis and have a low threshold to refer urgently and appropriately to, to colleagues who can secure ability drainage because this really does save lives. The other important one I just wanted to mention, uh, not to forget, is that the other common cause that we see of patients presenting with cholangitis would be patients with block stents. Um, and remember that these are patients who are, are actually very easily treatable. Uh, these stents are easily retrieved and a new stent can easily be placed in, in what could be an abbreviated procedure. And quite often that can make a very sick patient uh, uh, improve um, in a short time. So when you see cholangitis uh, sort of day and over, the patients with the block stents will often be patients who've defaulted or missed uh, their, their follow-ups for whatever reason. Uh, so as I say, uh, day and over cholangitis, beware of stone disease and block stents and be prepared to, to intervene quickly and appropriately. I think the other important thing, you know, when we talk about how sick these patients get is that it's often infected bile under a fair amount of pressure. So these patients will often have high bilirubins, and there may have been a delay in presentation or a delay in referral. And once again, you know, if one, if one expedites the biliary decompression, that is key to, to improving these patients um, in the acute phase. And as I say, you know, you really can save lives in this respect. A word of warning, um, be on the lookout for those patients who've developed portal vein thrombosis in the setting of cholangitis, and in particular, uh, if they've got cholangitic abscesses as well. These patients can often become a lot sicker and be a lot more challenging to manage and improve quickly uh, than other patients, because if there's an associated portal vein thrombosis in the setting of, of uh, cholangitis, Quite often, these patients will actually have portal pyophlebitis, and even the urgent delivery, even urgent biliary decompression, uh, these patients may 
not improve uh, uh, dramatically in the short term. And it's important that these patients are managed in the ICU, receive organ support, the appropriate antibiotics, and anticoagulation in order to prevent propagation of the, of the infected thrombus. Uh, and these patients often can uh, require a lot longer before they improve uh, and require prolonged and intensive support. But once again, uh, these patients are often younger, fitter, with less comorbid disease because they're patients with, with stone or, or other type, other forms of benign disease. So be aware of portal vein thrombosis, be aware to be, be prepared to treat it aggressively, but often the therapy is more prolonged and requires more intensive support. Um, I think in terms of the criteria for the diagnosis of cholangitis, uh, I think you correctly mentioned that that Charcot's uh, uh, triad per se has has a low sensitivity but pretty good specificity, and certainly uh, that's what we what we see practically. And so again, it just emphasizes that you need to have a low threshold uh, for the for diagnosis in these patients. And really, uh, you know, you you may pick up. The clinical features, but this is really where we really are heavily dependent on imaging. And here I want to add a caution, a word of caution as far as CT scans are concerned. So you mentioned a, a, a sensitivity uh, for CT scans of diagnosing stones of about 42%. In fact, I think it's probably a little bit lower than that. That, that may have been specifically in the setting of cholangitis. I think if you look across the board, uh, the sensitivity of CT scans for picking up gallstones across all gallstone-related conditions is only about 20%. And so, you know, I think there's often a knee-jerk reaction when a patient presents with abdominal pain, features of sepsis. Uh, there's a knee-jerk reaction to just get a CT scan. And it can be, and not infrequently, we see that the diagnosis of, of cholangitis or, or stones in the bile duct is not entertained early on or, or even missed. And so I really want to encourage you that in patients who present with jaundice, really or, or clearly obstructive jaundice, um, an ultrasound should really must be part of your initial investigations. You shouldn't just rest with a CT scan. The CT scan may show you the biliary dilatation, but again, uh, quite frequently we get a report of, well, there's an obstruction of the bile duct, there's sepsis, no obvious cause except for the narrowing of the bile duct, but then you go and do the ERCP and it's quite clearly stone disease. And, and, that, and having been aware of that early on may have changed, may potentially have changed your, your initial approach. So really, I think in, this, in patients who are jaundiced and su suspected biliary obstruction, ultrasound should always be your first port of call in terms of imaging. And if you find a patient who has the clinical features to suggest cholangitis and there are stones and biliary dilatation, well, then you've made the diagnosis and that patient should actually proceed straight to uh, an ERCP uh, without necessarily the need for a CT scan. The CT scan is appropriate to the setting of biliary obstruction where gallstones have been excluded because that's where you're now thinking about malignant or other causes. Um, Again, uh, a word of warning, this is a condition that we see rarely, uh, what I'm about to, to describe. And that is the patient who presents with sepsis and jaundice, but has no biliary dilatation. And this may herald or indicate the presence of cholestasis in the setting of overwhelming sepsis. So it's a situation that we see maybe once a year, you may see it, uh, you know, if I recall the, the cases that we've seen, uh, it's, it's significant sepsis as you might see with say a 40 years gangrene. We had a patient in ICU where our acute surgical service and the, and the physicians were going backwards and forwards over two to three days arguing about what the patient should get. And no one had actually examined the perineum and noted that the patient had, had uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, soft tissue sepsis that was the necrotizing uh, soft tissue sepsis that was the source uh, of the sepsis. And the, and the jaundice merely reflected cholestasis and the advanced nature uh, of the septic process. So on occasion, you may see patients who are septic, jaundiced, but who don't have biliary dilatation. And be aware of that scenario because that patient may, may not be managed well with invasive PTC or ERCP biliary drainage, and there may be a delay in treating the real source 
uh, of the sepsis. So, so be aware of that pitfall. When we talk about the severity of, uh, of cholagitis and the severity of sepsis, uh, I mean, you mentioned it in the in the as part of being part of the Tokyo guidelines, and I, I really just want to add my support to what you said and to emphasize this, that it really comes down to the presence of organ dysfunction. If you have biliary, true biliary obstruction together with sepsis, when your patient develops organ dysfunction, that patient is about to die. And you need to really expedite the biliary drainage and, and the use of appropriate antibiotics in that patient. Organ dysfunction, as in so many inflammatory conditions, uh, heralds uh, the, the start of organ failure. And as we all know, the, you know, the degree and amount of organ failure that you have directly corresponds with, uh, with mortality. So, so I really want to uh, uh, emphasize the presence of organ dysfunction. And where that is present, you need to act emergently and, um, and appropriately. And the one thing that doesn't appear in the guidelines and is probably something to worth keeping in mind is the presence of elevated lactate in that setting. So a, a blood gas is, is really, uh, I think, a critical part of the assessment uh, of those types of patients. The technique of early biliary drainage, uh, I think, can be difficult. Uh, sometimes you have a patient who is relatively stable. Uh, there may be only early organ dysfunction. You think the patient is stable enough for an ERCP, and an ERCP is probably the preferred method of, of biliary drainage in the majority uh, of circumstances. But of course, that also depends on your access to ERCP, depends on the skills uh, and, and, and resources available to you. It depends on the availability of that. There are some institutions where ERCP is difficult to organize after hours. And in addition, um, in patients who are unstable, uh, an ERCP may, be, may not be appropriate and may be difficult. And in that setting, in fact, a PTC uh, may be more appropriate. And that is certainly on occasion been um, our preferred approach. So patients who are unstable requiring organ support uh, and you don't, don't think it's appropriate to introduce an endoscope into and where uh, accessing the bile duct may be more difficult and, and carry the risk of pancreatitis, in that case, uh, a PTC may be your better option. So I do think that um, it's difficult to apply uh, a, a general rule as to what technique is better. I think it has to be individualized and it is probably institutionally driven. Uh, but uh, and, and you need to make a you need to make a decision about what is uh, appropriate uh, in your specific circumstances. Certainly, I think in a sick patient, um, and I think you mentioned this, uh, but certainly our, our objective is not to treat the patient definitively uh, necessarily. Uh, what you want to secure is biliary drainage. It's, it's stasis, it's infected bile under pressure that makes a patient sick. And removing either the infection or uh, uh, the obstruction, or preferably both, is what turns these patients around. And so if you're doing an ERCP, you don't have to uh, uh, spend a prolonged period trying to get all the stones out. Just get a stent in, make sure it's working, and, and, and get out and offer the patient an abbreviated procedure until such time as their general condition improves. Alternatively, if you're going for a PTC, just tell the radiologist just to get the PTC into the biliary system and to decompress the biliary system. They don't have to try getting an internal, external catheter in. They don't have to try and deal with the stones. All that you want is the system drain. You did mention EUS guided biliary drainage, and I think that's perhaps not incorrect from an academic standpoint. There are places around the world and places within this country as well where there are very competent uh, EUS practitioners um, who are comfortable doing these procedures. But they are technically challenging procedures and they are absolutely not for the novice endoscopist or even the novice uh, or, or relatively experienced uh, EUS practitioner. As I said, these are very technical procedures and there's a low margin for error. 
certainly what people have done a lot of it they are they get easier and they and they certainly can be done quickly and appropriately but um i think in the setting of benign disease the role for eos biliary drainage is still to be clearly defined um and uh, as i said it's it's a procedure that uh, even in the best of hands can be challenging so um, i think as a in terms of its role for uh, urgent biliary decompression, the setting of cholangitis from from stone disease. Uh, I think that that is probably not yet appropriate outside of uh, a trial setting or institutions where uh, who are very experienced with with EUS biliary drainage. Moving on to acute cholecystitis, uh, just a word about the HIDA scan. So you mentioned it's it's high sensitivity. Um, but I noticed that that article doesn't refer to specificity. And I think that's an important thing to appreciate about, you know, what is a HIDA scan and how does it actually work? So a HIDA scan um, assesses the ability of the gallbladder to empty. What you're doing is you're giving a, a, a radio labeled substrate or substance, and you're testing how quickly does the gall, does that substance empty out of the gallbladder. Now, a gallbladder that has got acute cholecystitis, yes, for sure, it's going to have delayed intake. That's part of the whole. That's part of the whole pathophysiology. But on the other hand, um, it's certainly in the non-acute setting we see um, positive HIDA scans quite frequently in the absence of disease. So the specificity for for a HIDA scan is low, and I would think that I, I, my impression, it, it, well, let's say HIDA scan is still available. In certain institutions, but certainly not all institutions, and I think there are a number of institutions that are, that have moved away from a HIDA scan um, as an assessment tool in in acute cholecystitis. Um, so I would be cautious about raising that as as a primary uh, diagnostic tool, uh, certainly in the exam setting. Uh, I think probably ultrasound probably represents the most useful. Uh, investigative tool to diagnose acute curly cystitis. Certainly in terms of its sensitivity and specificity, and in terms of its availability, uh, you mentioned that it's operator dependent, but even the, the even junior uh, radiologists and, and even radiographers uh, should be able to image the gallbladder well, should be able to pick up the presence of stones, uh, should be able to, to measure the wall and tell if there's pericholecystic fluid. So I really think ultrasound is probably your first uh, line of it, of imaging in the setting of acute cholecystitis, certainly in our practice. A word about common bile duct stones in the, in the setting of acute cholecystitis. And I think it's a very important uh, issue that you've raised, and it needs to be something that is considered in every patient uh, with symptomatic gallstones. And really, I think if one wants to make it simple, you could group patients into high, intermediate risk, and low risk. The low risk patients are patients who have normal LFTs and no biliary dilatation on imaging. Intermediate risk are patients who have one of either of those. In other words, there's either biliary dilatation uh, or abnormal LFTs. And then the high risk patients are ones that have both. And certainly your intermediate and your high risk patients, you should, should have some form of further assessment to confirm or exclude whether there are uh, gallstones present. Now, in our practice, most of these patients are coming to a cholecystectomy. And so really, um, our algorithm is that in any patient where there's intermediate or high risk of, of, a, of a CBD stone being present, that patient has to have an intraoperative cholangiogram. And if the intraoperative cholangiogram is not possible or, or fails, or for whatever reason, then you need another alternative means of imaging the, the biliary system, being an ultrasound, uh, even laparoscopic, or, or uh, an MRCP. But really, often the simplest thing to do, your patient needs a cholecystectomy, do the cholecystectomy, and do an intraoperative cholangiogram. And if stones are picked up on the intraoperative cholangiogram, you can either extract them uh, transcystically or uh, uh, trans... Um, or, or by doing a bile duct exploration, or you could do an on-table ERCP 
or you can even uh, place a wire down the bile duct and perform a post-operative ERCP. But obviously it makes sense in these patients to try and do a one-stop uh, procedure. And if you are able to perform an ERCP in theater, uh, then that's probably the best option. And as I mentioned, what you can do is you could put a guide wire down the bile duct uh, from where you've opened uh, either through the cystic duct or the bile duct. You could place the wire across the papilla and then grab that wire with your ERCP scope and do uh, what we call a rendezvous procedure. And by doing that, you minimize the risk of pancreatitis quite significantly. And so that approach has not just logistical benefits in saving the patient additional procedures, it, it reduces the potential morbidity um, of an ERCP as well. So I really like to, to encourage um, you to keep that approach in mind. Um, it's something that we've really taken on in our practice uh, quite a lot in, over the last few years. And having said that, I think it's important, therefore, to differentiate between your patients who have proven bile duct stones. You know they've got a stone on their, on their ultrasound or whatever. That's a different scenario. In that scenario, you may decide to do a preoperative ERCP uh, just for logistical reasons. But again, um, you know, as I've mentioned, uh, often these patients can be served well by a, a single-stage procedure in theater. The alternative is where you have possible or suspected bile duct stones. And in that case, uh, that's really the scenario that I described just before, where I think an on-table on cholangiogram is a very efficient way of assessing the duct and gives you the opportunity to proceed directly to, to biliary clearance. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention, I, I thought your, your L, um, flow chart uh, detailing the role of early lap coli and the approach to early, early lap coli was, was very good. I just wanted to remind the audience that uh, you will find different nomenclature. And there are studies where uh, the definition of early lap laparoscopic cholecystectomy is within 72 hours. So I think there has been a shift from focusing on the first 72 hours as opposed to the first week. I think you should just be aware that in some of the literature, they do differentiate uh, between um, the early being the first 72 hours and an intermediate period being up to up to seven days. And there are places that perhaps would not be that keen to pursue uh, a cholecystectomy within the three to seven day period. Okay, I think uh, I've taken us just past seven o'clock. Um, Karen, I'm not sure if you are, are in the meeting still. I see we have one question from the chat room. Do we have time for that? Yes, of course, Sean, that's fine. Thank you. Great, thanks, Karen. So, so we have a question. What is the timing of surgery in patients with emphysematous cholecystitis? So I think, you know, when you see emphysematous cholecystitis, I think you need to be concerned that you have a gangrenous gallbladder. And that's a patient who probably needs their gallbladder out earlier rather than later. And so uh, that's a patient who probably needs a, a visit to theater uh, within the next few hours. If they are too unwell to allow for that, you may decide to pursue a percutaneous uh, cholecystectomy or cholecystostomy rather. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think if you've, if you've diagnosed emphysematous uh, gallbladder, that gallbladder needs to come out. You need to be concerned about, about gangrene there. Your patient may not improve until that gallbladder is removed. Um, I didn't really want to go into too much detail now, but just to say um, the approach to when you have utilized a cholecystostomy, these are usually patients who are too sick to, to proceed to theater. And a, a cholecystostomy is really done as a salvage type uh, procedure. Once your patient has improved, the approach would be to establish whether the cystic duct is patent. And that can be done by means of a cholecystogram, ejecting contrast down the, the catheter into the gallbladder. If the cystic duct is patent, the catheter can be blocked. If the patient remains well, or capped rather, if the patient remains well, the cholecystostomy can be removed at a later date and the patient evaluated for a cholecystectomy. If the cystic duct remains blocked, um, then naturally you need to, to keep your uh, cholecystostomy tube uh, uncapped on free drainage um, and decide what is the most appropriate way forward for, for your patient. 
Okay, um, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I've made most of the comments that I, that I really wanted to do. Uh, once again to uh, Petun's eye, uh, really, I think a great presentation. Thank you very, very much. I think you did a, a lot of good work and uh, um, I think you're, you're, you, you summarized all the important points really well. Um, I'm not sure if you have anything that you want to add, Petun Tsai. Uh, I think just your, your, your stall, uh, you're, um, you're, you're muted. Yep. Um, thank you very much. I don't have any uh, further comments. Okay. Um, great. In that case, I think we probably have come to the end of the meeting. Uh, we're a little bit over time. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, and I think I don't see any more further questions. So with that, um, I'm going to say thank you to uh, Petun Tsai in particular. Uh, again, really a, a great presentation. Um, thank you to the ECHO group from the University of New Mexico and the ECHO India team for, for their support. Uh, just to remind you that the recordings are available on the Gastro Foundation website, and we must express our thanks to, to the Gastro Foundation in terms of their, their support for these meetings. Um, please note that the meetings take place every two weeks. So the next meeting will be on uh, Monday, the 21st of August um, at eight o'clock, uh, uh, sorry, six o'clock, 1800. Uh, the topic on that occasion will be liver abscesses and cystic liver disease. Uh, the presenter being Dr. Desiree Moodley and the chairman, Professor Kloppers uh, from Cape Town. Um, I think we all, uh, anyone who's practiced in the South African context and I'm sure in, in the rest of the sub-Saharan region will have encountered um, uh, 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 hydatid disease of the liver. It's certainly something that we almost have an epidemic of uh, in, in South Africa. Um, and so I think that's a really important, uh, a really important talk. Good. So once again, thank you, everybody. And uh, I wish you uh, a good evening for uh, going forward. Thanks, everyone. And hope to see you at the Congress on Wednesday. Right. Uh, thank, thank you, you Karen. Bye now. Bye.